All right. Hey, humans. <laughs> How we doing out there? Come on in, start gathering around the, uh, the old digital campfire. <laughs> Let me hear from those of you who are in line uh, right now. Tell me, uh, tell me who's out there and tell me where you're tuning in from. I hope you're starting to get your questions and thoughts ready for our guest. I'm sure many of you have already seen who our guest is and I'll be reading her bio here in just a moment. So start thinking of your questions about commercial content moderation and, and what you want to know about that and you know all that kind of stuff. Uh, I hear Sarah laughing in the background. It's, it's not to laugh. We, there's a lot of really good, valid questions people I think, are going to have. I think this. I was just snorting, honestly, <laughs> okay. through my uh, through my so, sinus trouble. So uh, <laughs> welcome to those of you who are all tuned in. Welcome to the Tech Humanist Show. This is a multimedia format program exploring how data and technology shape the human experience. And I am your host, Kate O'Neill. Uh, so I hope you'll subscribe and follow wherever you're catching this so that you won't miss any new episodes. I am going to introduce our guest here in just a moment. Uh, one, one last shout out. Uh, if anybody's out there wanting to say hi, feel free. You are welcome to comment and I see a bunch of you online. So feel free to, to tune, uh, comment in and, and tell me who you are and where you're tuning in from. But just get those, you know, typing fingers warmed up because we're going to want you to, to weigh in with some questions and comments as the show goes on. But now I'll go ahead and introduce our esteemed guest. So today we have the very great privilege of talking with Sarah T. Roberts, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Information Studies, Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA. She holds a PhD from the I School at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, my sister school. I went to University of Illinois at Chicago. Prior to joining UCLA in 2016, she was an assistant professor in the Faculty of Information and Media Studies at Western University in London, Ontario for three years. On the internet since 1993, she was previously an information technology professional for 15 years and as such, her research interests focus on information work and workers and on the social, economic, and political impact of the widespread adoption of the internet in everyday life. Right? Totally. <laughs> so. Since 2010, the main focus of her research has been to uncover the ecosystem made up of people, practices, and politics of content moderation of major social media platforms, news media companies, and corporate brands. As she served as consultant to and is featured in the award-winning documentary, The Cleaners, which debuted at Sundance 2018 and aired on PBS in the United States in November uh, 2018. So Roberts is frequently consulted by the press and others on issues related to commercial content moderation and to social media, society, and culture in general. She's been interviewed on these topics in print, on radio, on television worldwide, and now on the Tech Humanist Show, uh, including the New York Times, Associated Press, NPR, Le Monde, The Atlantic. I mean, this list is going to go on and on, so buckle in, folks. Uh, the Economist, BBC, uh, Rolling Stone, Wired, I'm picking and choosing now. It's a really, really impressive list of media. She is a 2018 Carnegie Fellow and a 2018 recipient of the EFF Barlow Pioneer Award for her groundbreaking research on content moderation of social media. So audience, again, please start getting your questions ready for our outstanding guest. Please do note, as a live show, I, well, I'll do my best to vet comments and questions in real time. We may not get to all of them, uh, but very much appreciate you being here, tuned in, and participating in the show. So with that, please welcome uh, our dear guest, Sarah T. Roberts, and you are live on the show. Sarah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation, and thanks to your audience and uh, all those interested folks who are spending time with us today. I'm really grateful yeah, for the opportunity. Absolutely. We've already got uh, David Polgar saying excited mm -hmm. for today's talk. Hey. Our hey, buddy hello. Dave, DRP. Yes. Yes. <laughs> all right. So I want to talk right away about your... Um, your book behind the screen I, I had hadn't had a chance to read and until I was preparing for the show and it was a, it was wonderful to get a chance to dig into your research so tell us a little bit about that came out last year is that right um, yeah it just just a little over a year ago uh, came out on on Yale University Press um, you know the academic publishing cycle is its own beast it's its own world <laughs> it uh, as it relates to um, kind of like journalism and, and mainstream press timelines, it's much slower. That said, uh, I wrote the book in about a year, which is about a normal 
a normal cycle, but it took about eight years to put together the research that went into the book. And this is because when I started my research in 2010, which, you know, we say 2010, it seems like yesterday, that was a decade ago now, <laughs> you know, if we're interminable 2020, you know, yes. which is, which is a million years long so far. But back in 2010, when I started looking into this topic as a, as a doctoral researcher at the University of Illinois, uh, you know, there were a lot of things stacked against that endeavor, including the fact that I was a doctoral student at the University of Illinois, I had no cachet, I had very few, like material resources, um, you know, to finance uh, a study uh, that would require, uh, at the end of the day, required going around the world, quite literally. Um, but maybe the biggest barrier at the time was the fact that uh, I was still fighting an uphill battle trying to tell people that major mainstream social media platforms were engaged in a practice that is now weirdly, um, you know, a, a, a phrase that you might say around the dinner table and everyone would get, which is mm -hmm. content moderation. Mm -hmm. And that further, when I would um, <clears throat> raise the issue and, and bring up the fact that firms were engaged in this practice, which, you know, has to do with the adjudication of people's self-expression online and sit somewhere between users and the platform and then the platform's recirculation of users' material, uh, you know, people would argue with me at that point uh, about the fact that that practice would even go on. And then when I would say that, uh, you know, kind of offer incontrovertible proof that in fact it did go on, uh, then we would uh, find ourselves in a debate about whether or not it was a, a legion of human beings who was undertaking this work, or uh, in fact, it was computational. Now, in, 2010, in 2020, the landscape is complicated, but in 2010, the technology and the sort of widespread adoption of, of computational uh, automated, let's say, algorithmic kinds of content moderation or machine learning informed content moderation was not a thing. It mm -hmm. was human. And so I, I had to start the conversation so far below baseline <laughs> that it, it, you know, it, it took, uh, it took quite a lot of effort just to get everybody on the same page mm -hmm. to discuss it. And, and, you know, when I'm talking about, uh, engaging in these conversations, I mean, just like trying to vet this as a, as an appropriate research topic at the graduate school, wow. you know what I mean? Like to get faculty members, many of whom were world experts in, in various aspects of, uh, of the internet or of, of media or information systems themselves. Um, it was new to them too. That how was did you originally things. frame it? Was it it's a question of how is this done or how, what was the original framework of that question? Yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the origin of why I got interested. And it's something that I write about in the book because I think it's so important to acknowledge kind of those, um, those antecedents. I had read, I was actually teaching down at the University of Illinois in the summer uh, of 2010. And I was on a break from teaching and, you know, probably drinking a, a latte, which is what I'm doing right now. And, um, <laughs> and uh, uh, reading the paper, I was reading the New York Times, and there was a very small, uh, but compelling article in the New York Times about a group of workers who were, there were, there were a couple of sites they mentioned, but there was in particular a group of workers in rural Iowa. Well, here I was sitting in rural, central Illinois, thinking about this group of workers in rural Iowa as profiled in this piece who were in fact engaging in what we now know as commercial content moderation. They were working in effectively a call center, uh, adjudicating content for unnamed kind of, you know, media sites, websites, and social media properties. And I kind of circulated that article around. I shared it with friends. I shared it with my colleagues and I shared it with professors and, the argument that I made was that um, it was it was multifaceted. First of all, it sounded like a miserable job. Mm -hmm. And guess what? That has been borne out. It is mm -hmm. a very difficult and largely unpleasant job. Uh, so I was captivated by that fact that there were these, you know, the unnamed people who uh, a generation or two ago would have been on a family farm who were now in the quote unquote information economy, but seemed to be doing a, a drag, a, a, just awful work 
but also there was this bigger issue of, uh, you know, really having this this big reveal of the of the actual ecosystem an unknown heretofore unknown portion of the social media ecosystem as, as effectively letting us know how the sausage was being made. Mm-hmm. Right. And yet, if you were to look at any of the the uh, the social media platforms themselves or any of the discourse at really high levels in industry or in regulatory bodies, this was not this was a non-starter. But I was was arguing at the time that how content was being adjudicated on the platforms, under what circumstances, under what conditions and under what policies was, in fact, maybe the only thing that mattered at the end of the day. Right now, in 2010, that was a little bit of a harder case to make by 2016. Not so much after we saw the uh, the ascent of Donald Trump in the United States. We saw Brexit. We saw uh, this, the rise of, of Bolsonaro in, in Brazil, largely uh, attributed to um, social media campaigns mm-hmm. there and uh, kind of this continued sustained support through those channels. Uh, and here we are in 2020 where uh, we might argue or we might claim that misinformation and disinformation online is one of the primary concerns of civil society today. And I would put front and center in those all of those uh, discussions the fact that social media companies have this incredible immense power to decide what stays up and what doesn't and how they do it and who they engage to do it should actually be part of the conversation if not I would argue that it's a very incomplete conversation. So when I talk about like the, the scholarly publishing cycle, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it took a year to put the book out, right? But it took eight years to amass the evidence, to um, to do the do the interviews and media that you mentioned, to converse with industry people at the top levels eventually, but you know starting at the bottom with the workers sure. themselves to find workers who were willing to talk to me and break those non disclosure agreements that they were under. Um, and to kind of uh, create also a, a locus of activity for other researchers and scholars and activists who are also interested in, in, in uncovering uh, this area and really sort of create, co-create a field mm-hmm. of study. So that's what took eight years. It took a year to get the book out. Um, but all that legwork of proving in a way that mm-hmm. this mattered took a lot longer. I don't have to make that same case anymore, as I'm sure you you can imagine. Sure. Um, people. Yeah people are interested, they're concerned, and um, they want to know more. They're demanding a lot more um, from firms as users, you know, as people who are now engaged in social media in some aspect of their lives every day need, I say, more about Zooming constantly, which is now our, our, you know, our primary medium of of connection for so many of us in our work lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, we already have a question from... uh... Our buddy DRP, David Ryden Polgar. Let me uh, put this against the background. We can actually see it here. Uh, he says, Sarah, I would love to hear your thoughts on section 230 and how any potential changes would impact content moderation. So we're going right in, right deep. <laughs> yeah, really. So um, let me try to flesh that out a little bit for others who aren't um, you know, inside quite as, as deep. Um, section 230 is a part of the uh, Communications Decency Act, which goes back to 1996. But effectively, what what anyone needs to know about Section 230 is that it's the it, it it's sort of the legal framework that informs social media companies' rights and responsibilities around content. When we think about legacy media, um, so-called. Uh, broadcast television, for example, or other other forms of, of media that we consume. You know, some, I always bring up the, the example of George Carlin, who famously, um, uh, you know, made a career out of the seven dirty words right. that you couldn't say on radio, right? So there are all kinds of governing uh, legal and other kinds of norms about what is allowed and disallowed in some of these legacy media. When it comes to social media, however, there is a, a pretty uh, 
drastically contrasted permissiveness that is in place uh, that seeds the power of the decision making around what is allowable and what is not allowable to the platforms themselves. So this is a really different kind of paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. And it's section 230 that allows that. That's the that's the precedent. That's the that's the guidance uh, legally that uh, that provides that kind of uh, both responsibility and discretion. And what it does is it allows the companies um, to make their own decisions effectively about what policies they will follow internally. Now, this doesn't go for every single piece of content. You know, one of the the biggest examples that. Uh, that this does not cover is child sexual exploitation material, which is just illegal full stop. It doesn't matter if platforms wanted to traffic in that material or not, it's illegal. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, to, to, a certain, to a certain extent, what Section 230 allows is for platforms to redistribute effectively material that other people submit uh, without being held liable for that material. And so if we think about that, that's actually the business model of social media. Mm -hmm. The business model of social media is to get other people to create content, upload it, circulate it, engage with it, download it. And effectively, the platforms have, um, you know, argued and claimed that they are really, you know, don't kill the messenger, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're just like the, 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 the apparatus by which this material gets shared. I think that... Um, you know, at one time that really made sense, particularly when the when this um, when the Communications Decency Act was passed, and this goes back in into the mid '90s, mm -hmm. when what was kind of imagined as needing this this uh, reprieve from liability was an ISP, an Internet Service Provider, which at that time, uh, I guess the most imaginative version of that you could think of would be America Online. Mm -hmm. For those of you who even remember that. <laughs> on the program shout today. out to the aol days yeah right aol <laughs> like all the you know the discs and cd roms you got and used as coasters <laughs> right. um but you know back in that time a, an internet service provider really was a pass-through in some cases you know i knew a guy who ran an isp locally mm -hmm. he really just had a room with a with a huge internet pipe coming in uh -huh. and, a, and a wall of modems and you would sure. dial up through your modem and connect through and then be on the internet to some other service so that was the model then but the model now uh, is, you know, multi-billion dollar transnational corporations uh, who have immense power in decision making around content and yet are, are uh, in the American context at least, largely not liable for those decisions uh, legally or, or otherwise, um, making in incredibly powerful decisions about what kind of material we all see and engage in and what is permissible and what is not online and they do that at their discretion well if they're doing that at their discretion do you think that they're largely going to um fall into a mode of altruism and like what's best for civil society or are they going to look at their bottom line and their shareholder demands and respond to that. I mean, should we take frankly, a poll of the audience? <laughs> yeah, I mean, frankly, publicly traded companies have a legal mandate to respond to their shareholders and to generate revenue for them. So, um, when those things are at odds, when when those things are aligned, when what's good for you know America is good for uh, Facebook's internal policies around content moderation, that works out great. Mm -hmm. But if there's you know if ever those two pathways should diverge we know which one they're going to fall under. And there's just, there's very little um, legal consequence or legal uh, expectation for uh, reporting out on how uh, these decisions get made. The way that, the, that we have seen more decisions getting uh, publicly unveiled through things like um, the publication of, of what had been previously kind of closely held secret policies internally is through public pressure, through the pressure of civil society groups and advocacy groups, through the pressure of uh, the public, through the pressure of, and the constant threat of, you know, things like reform to mm -hmm. Section 230 or other kinds of regulation. So it, it's a very interesting moment and it's interesting to bring up Section 230 because, uh, again, a couple of years ago, I had colleagues... Um, 
who are in uh, legal studies and who are, you know, law professors essentially tell me that 230 would soon be rendered moot anyway, because it's just it's it's, you know, based on um, on. Well, it should be solely relevant in the United States, right, in the jurisdiction of the United States. And so because these platforms were going worldwide, uh, you know, there, it would be rendered moot. Well, I would say it's actually been the opposite. That's right. that what is happening is that Section 230 is getting bundled up as the norm and is now being promulgated either just through uh, through the process of these platforms going global, but kind of keeping their Americanness and keeping their um their response, their you know, business practices largely responsible to American laws first and foremost, but also even to the point that uh, you know it recently has become known. I think more and more to people like me who aren't legal scholars but who have a great interest in how this stuff goes down. Mm -hmm. That Section Two Thirty like language is being bundled up and put into trade agreements. Uh, at the nation state level mm -hmm. or, you know, region level with the United States and, uh, and trading partners. And we know that, you know, these these trade agreements, which have been, you know, huge, hugely politically uh, problematic and were a major issue, in fact, of the 2016 election, uh, you know, they're 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 anti-democratic. I mean, how do you even know what's in a trade agreement? They're totally secret. Uh, but I, I learned while watching a, a, a House a subcommittee uh, convening about Section 230 from a, a highly placed Google executive that, in fact, their their lobbyists are pushing for this kind of language in in these trade agreements. So we see that in, instead of 230 becoming less relevant because of the globalization of American social media platforms, it's actually becoming a norm that is now being, first of all, it was sort of like softly reproduced just because of the spread of these American platforms and how they were doing business. But now it's actually becoming codified through other means, uh, means like, like trade agreements that the public has really no mechanism to intervene upon. And I think that's really worrisome. What about those mechanisms that's, that's, where the, I'm sorry, what were you going to say? No, okay, I was just going to say that's one of my short and concise professorial answers. <laughs> <laughs> Let me drink a coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, David, uh, thanks you for that uh, great historical overview, and I'm sure the rest of our viewers and listeners do too. I, I wonder about the ones, the, the uh, examples that don't have that kind of, uh, consumer involvement. So I'm wondering about, for example, you know, YouTube and its kids content. And, and so there have been a lot of changes, it seems like, with regard to that, that platform and that subject over the, over the last few years. So can you, can you maybe give us an overview of how that has gone down? Uh, well, I think that, you know, YouTube is such an interesting example to talk about for, for many reasons, uh, for its reach and pervasiveness, you know, mm -hmm. it's a market leader for sure, it's, it's globality. I would also say that YouTube is particularly interesting because when we think about uh, social media content as being uh, monetized, mm -hmm. there is no greater and more direct example than YouTube where it actually pays people who are really highly successful right. on the platform for content, right? So like when, there's no kind of like a metaphor there about monetization. It is literally monetized, right? Um, and this, you know, just to kind of uh, tie this back to the Section 230 conversation, when we imagined ISPs as just pass-throughs, pass you know, that was one thing. But mm -hmm. here we have these huge companies like YouTube and others involved actively in production. Mm -hmm. So that kind of like firewall between just being an intermediary and actually being actively engaged in producing media has gone, but the, there's like a legacy legal environment that it still informs it. So YouTube, you know, they pay producers, they have these like uh, pretty extraordinary studios in, in, major, uh, in, in major cities around mm -hmm. the world, including LA where I live. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, they are kind of the go-to outlet and people want to participate in YouTube for all sorts of reasons, but there's certainly, you know, a dollar sign reason that people get involved. And you bring up this issue of kids content. Mm -hmm. um, 
again, here's where we see sort of like the softening and the eroding of, of regulation too. It started, it's, it's not just YouTube, I have to confess. It's not just social media companies that have eroded, uh, you know, child protections around um, a media. That, that goes back to the, you know, 40 years ago in the Reagan administration when there used to be very stringent rules around uh, Saturday morning cartoons, mm -hmm. for example, and advertising to children that could go on during that time. Uh, shout out to my colleague Molly Neeson, who has worked extensively on that on that particular topic and that erosion. So I see uh, on on YouTube again a lot of the pressure to kind of reform. And I think when you're talking about kids' content, you're talking about some of like some like really disturbing and weird content that was showing up. Um, you know, kind of like cheaply made, unknown, weird, creepy, sometimes not really clearly necessarily uh benevolently made like you know sometimes creepy sexual undertones mm -hmm. uh other kinds of stuff going on you know really and really no way to know that's mm -hmm. part of the problem no way to know right um and then uh the massive problem of trying to moderate that material right um you know i think of it as like the the classic story of the the whole springing through the, the, the dike holding the water back, you know, mm -hmm. you plug one hole, another one springs open. So or it's a little bit- the whole wall falls down. Or or the whole wall and then you're inundated. That's right. right, that's right. And so, you know, that is a good metaphor to think about the problem of these like kind of isolated uh, hot spots that mm -hmm. explode on platforms as a new social issue or maybe a new uh, a geopolitical conflict erupts somewhere in the world, it's, you know, gets meted out and replicated on social media and attention gets drawn to it. And so I think this issue of child content and its kind of exploitive nature and, and strange nature in some cases was something that advocacy groups and others brought attention to and mm -hmm. the platform had to reconfigure and focus on it. Now, I mentioned earlier that, you know, back in 2010, it really was humans who were doing this work almost exclusively. But by 2020, we are using computational tools to try to deal with content as well. Although I, I'll repeat the quote that I once heard from a reporter who, who heard it from a, an engineer at a company that shall not be named, but it might sound like, um, you know, boob doob, let's say, might ry rhyme with that. Uh, and the quote was, uh, whatever the algorithm is doing, it's not watching the video. So, you know, they're using these computational mechanisms to do all kinds of other stuff, but it's not like an algorithm can watch and sense make out of a video. It has to look at other stuff. So yeah. and that's an interesting point though too. And I want to yeah. follow up on that with a question about, yeah. you know, do you, do you personally advocate for more AI in the mix of con of content moderation, such as, you know, Facebook recently made an announcement that they were using AI to simulate bad actors so that they could train their moderation systems, automated moderation systems to more effectively recognize it. Do you think that that ultimately, will work and will benefit the humans who are part of this ecosystem or is it likely to produce unintended ill effects? So, I mean, that's a really great question because that's sort of like the $64,000 <laughs> question about my work. If, you know, one would, one would think if my concern is the welfare of workers, which has always kind of been my cut in on this topic and where I start and where I come back to and end, um, then, Hey, wouldn't it be great if tomorrow we could just flip that switch and go to those, uh, purely computational means. In I theory. think that, <laughs> yeah. in theory, right, in theory. But I think there are a lot of red flags there. Mm -hmm. You know, one red flag is that if it's been this difficult, as and I kind of laid the groundwork for that at the at the front end of the show, to unpack and uncover uh, the ecosystem involving humans. And mm -hmm. I have to say, the majority of my work has been reliant upon the willingness of human beings involved in the system right. to leak, essentially, to break their non-disclosure agreements and to, you know, essentially snitch on what they felt was problematic. Also, sometimes what they felt was good about the work they did. Mm -hmm. How do you get uh, an algorithm or a machine learning based tool to call a journalist or uh, you know, do an interview with a researcher. I don't know how to do that. You know, the closest thing we could come to is getting access to it and looking at code, but that's not easy to do. And it's right. much harder to do than finding 
uh, and I cannot stress the difficulty of what it was like in the early days to find people willing to talk to me. So, you know, you can't do that with AI. How do we, how do we audit those tools? How do we, how do we, you know, what's the check on power that the firms have with those tools in terms of how they're set up and what they keep in and what they keep out? It also sounds uh, like a potentially even greater violation of uh, that non-disclosure if someone leaks a bit of code rather than just tell their own personal story. Oh, for sure. I mean, and, and you know, the, the other thing, too, that that comes to mind for me is the nature of how these tools work. And, you know, a great worry and I think a legitimate worry of many people in the space is that uh, they the tendency to use those tools would be to. Uh, calibrate them to be even uh, less permissive, let's say, mm -hmm. or to, you know, because of their nature, they would have less of an, a, an ability to look at a given piece of content and, you know, see that it violates ABC policy, but understand it in the context of, you know, again, a cultural expression or, um, you know, an advocacy piece around a conflict zone and then make an exception. So what we would see is uh, more conservative and greater false positives around material that, quote unquote, is disallowed, right? Mm -hmm. Again, all of this adjudicating to the logic that the firms themselves create, which for, um, for many years itself was opaque. Uh, so this is, you know, it's not as easy as to say, unfortunately, if we could just get those darn algorithms right, if we could just get you know, machine learning to get sophisticated enough, we could take out the human element and, and basically, you know, save people from having to do this work. Unfortunately, I think it's more complicated than that. And I would say that, you know, it, bringing up the idea of training machine learning mm -hmm. tools as you did, one of the gross ironies of this whole thing that I've been monitoring is that uh, content moderation, commercial content moderation for these major platforms is its own kind of self-fulfilling uh, industry that begets uh, sub-industries in and of itself. So that when machine learning tools have come on, what needs to happen is that people need to sort data sets to create data sets for the machine learning tools to train on, and they need to be themselves trainers and classifiers for the machine learning tools. So now we have a whole new stratum of people working to train machine learning algorithms, which has them yeah. essentially doing a certain kind of content moderation. A, it's a, a cottage, logic that- A cottage industry of evil yeah. AI spawn. <laughs> it's it's like, like, and it's, like, how are we gonna make the AI bad enough to train our AI uh, automation systems to recognize that so that we can keep a good environment, but then you've got this whole cottage industry around the bad AI. It seems like a very so, yeah, backwards so, way of going about it. So, you know, as someone who monitors like like hiring <laughs> trends and things like that too, yeah. I was I was watching companies looking for people to, to come be classifiers on data okay. sets, which is just mo moderation before the fact, right? Yeah. You know, you talked about that in the book too. You have you presented a taxonomy of sorts of labor arrangements from in-house moderators to what you called micro labor. You know, looking at Mechanical Turk and things like that. Can you walk us through that a little bit so that we can become familiar with what the the human issues relative to each level? Yeah, one of the one of the early insights I had when I was trying to figure out the contours of this industry from you know, the outside, and it reminds me of that parable of, you know, people feeling different parts of the elephant without really be able, mm -hmm. being able to see it, and they don't really, they don't really get the big picture, um, was that, you know, what I was considering as being kind of like a monolithic practice really wasn't. It was mm -hmm. happening in all kinds of different places and in different guises, including using different names. Like, there was no kind of cohesive name to call this, this work practice. Mm -hmm. So I started out kind of knowing about these workers in, in Iowa that I referenced in the book and I referenced today uh, who were working in a call center. And it turned out that call centers were really a prevalent way that this work was going, that it was, um, you know, kind of at somewhat of a remove geographically and organizationally. So it'd be kind of like a third party contracted out group of workers somewhere in the world. When I started out, I knew about the workers in places like Iowa, Florida, et cetera. But I soon came to know about workers in places like India or in Malaysia or, of course, key to the book in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. So that... Um, that that call center environment for content moderation work is really prevalent and it's global. 
but there are also workers who uh, prior to COVID were going every day, for example, in the Bay Area down from San Francisco on the company buses um, and going on site to companies that I describe in the book, one that has the you know pseudonym of, of Megatech mm-hmm. and is a stand in for any number of companies. In fact, I'll just tell you a little anecdote that I've met a lot of people from industry who like over cocktails after meetings will come up to me all from different companies and say, we're mega tech, aren't we? And it's like, you know, like at least six different co- corporations think they're mega tech. So yes. Yes. <laughs> yes and, yeah, right? right? <laughs> yeah, that tells you something. So, um, you know, these people were on site workers. They were in, you know, the belly of the beast. Essentially, they were working in places where there was also uh, engineering, product development, marketing, uh, communications, uh, you know, soup to nuts. Mm-hmm. Uh, although, interestingly enough, they were also contractors in the case of the books. So they still had this differential and lesser status, even though they were going on site um, to the corporate HQ. You know, it still wasn't quite the right badge color, as they described it to me, although they thought about the people who were working as contractors and call centers as another kind of worker, even Mm -hmm. though they were essentially very, very similar. Then we had people that I encountered who were, you know, very entrepreneurial and especially in, in sort of the early days were developing um, a model that looks almost like an ad agency. They were Mm -hmm. independent companies that were starting to specialize in providing content moderation services to other companies. And it was a boutique kind of service, a specialty service. And they would often offer social media management across the board. So not only were they offering the removal of content in some cases, but they would even offer again in that advertising model, the generation of content, because believe it or not, sometimes, you know, your auto parts company's Facebook page just doesn't generate a lot of organic interest. And so you hire a company to come post about how awesome your auto parts company is. Um, Likewise, if there's a, you know, as somebody once told me, and it's in the book too, if you open a hole on the internet, it gets filled with bleep, with shit. Uh, You know, if you have a web page or you have a Facebook page and there's no activity that's like organic or really about what it's supposed to be about, I guarantee you that somebody will be posting invective, racist comments, and so on. These boutique firms said to usually to smaller companies, hey, we'll manage the whole thing. We'll delete that stuff. We'll generate new stuff for you. It'll look organic. Nobody will really know that that's what we're doing. And they were having great success when I talked to them. Was that and generally then, filed under the sort of banner of user-generated content, or was it called other things generally? Um, you know, it was kind of like a social media management yeah. is how they would mm-hmm. cou- couch that and how they would pitch it. And, uh, you know, it was like, uh, hey, company X, you your business has nothing really to do with social media. That's not, you know, your primary business. Let us handle it for you. And a lot of companies jumped at the chance to kind of outsource that and not deal with it. An interesting thing in that kind of bucket of, um, of the taxonomy that you mentioned is that uh, those companies uh, in some cases got bought up by ad firms or ad firms have started doing this service as well, or they've become really, really big and successful. So there's like a few that kind of uh, uh, rose to the top and have survived. And then you already mentioned this really interesting and and kind of uh, worrisome arena where this work goes on, which is in the micro labor realm, the Amazon Mechanical Turk model, Mm -hmm. uh, which is effectively, you know, digital piecework. It's people adjudicating a bit of content here or there often paid uh, per view or per decision. Uh, and then they try to aggregate enough to make that make sense for them financially. And it, it, it turns out, although that's supposed to be an anonymous relationship, you know, savvy mechanical Turkers, they can figure out who they're working for because a lot of times, you know, they'd receive a, a set of, of images or other content to adjudicate. And like, you know, the interface was obvious, <laughs> you know, yeah. they could tell the well, screenshot or... I assume they're also yeah. being given guidelines and those guidelines must right. be, you know, you kind can, of a good clue. If, you, yep, you can if you've done work for back. this company before and you get those guidelines again, then you know, yeah. That's right. So, you know, I, I came to know some folks who were, uh, you know, who themselves sort of began to specialize within 
Mechanical Turk and other platforms on this kind of thing. And they would seek out this work because they got good at it, like you said, Mm -hmm. and they got good at knowing the internal policies and juggling them for all these different firms and began to specialize in this work on that platform. I was wondering, you know, when thinking about this, as you mentioned earlier about the, the consequences of misinformation, especially as we are deep in the process of the U.S. presidential election cycle. And I, I say the U.S. because I want to be sensitive to the fact that there are global viewers, but I feel like everyone in the world is kind of, you know, hooked into the U.S. presidential election right now. And we're all uh, being, yeah, aren't they? <laughs> right? And we're all being subject to, you know, all of this, uh, well, the, the, the tr- dumpster fire of it all, but also the misinformation that accompanies it. And so I wonder how should people think and, and understand the difference between content on social media and content in news media? And what are some of the differences in, in approaches to moderating harmful content? And, you know, kind of just thinking about the access to, you know, free access to information. Yeah, you know, this is kind of a big mu- muddy question. I'm not sure I'm articulating it very well, but hopefully you see the direction of, of the, um, the question that I'm asking there. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll do my best to respond and we can, you know, we can, you can offer guidance. Puzzle it out. Too as I, right. Yeah, as I go. I mean, I, I think your question in essence is what the hell, right? <laughs> yeah. Inf- information, misinformation, disinformation, the election, what the hell. Mm-hmm. And so I think you speak for a global audience when you pose that question. <laughs> and you're right about the U.S. election. I know uh, friends and colleagues who were up early in Australia watching it and, you know, as mortified as we were by the, the behavior on display. Oh, the, and on the, the debate ki- the other night? Yes, saying, yeah. the debate and the kind of the nadir of, uh, you know, American politics mm-hmm. is, in my lifetime is, is how I described it. Um, you know, I, I often bring up the, the rise of social media as a force in again, in American civic life, that it's important to not think about it having happened in a vacuum or having happened uh, without without, um, other forces at play. And in the other part of my life, I am a professor in a program that trains and prepares people for careers in the information professions, primarily in librarianship. Mm. And so I know something about the way in which... um, we've seen a gross erosion of the American public sphere and opportunities for people to become informed in places that traditionally have been um, more transparent, more committed to the public good, not for profit. I'm thinking about uh, institutions like public schools Mm -hmm. and institutions like public libraries. So if we were to take you know, uh, funding, uh, a funding graph or something like that and put them together about expenditures or where, where money goes in in our society, we would see, you know, that off the cliff kind of defunding of, of these, uh, institutions that I just mentioned while we see a rise in social media. And what I think that suggests, at least to me, is that it's not that the American public doesn't have a desire to be informed or to have information sources. And I would add to that, by the way, it's not necessarily in the public sphere in the same way, but we have seen total erosion in regional and local journalism, too, right. during the same time, right? into me- that's, mega media. That's yes. right. Mega media, which, you know, came about by the shuttering of local news. Mm-hmm. And it, it, there was a time when, you know, cities like mine, I come from Madison, Wisconsin, 250,000 people. Shout out they, right. Yeah, they, yeah, they might have had a, a, a reporter in D.C., you know what I mean? And for our local paper, the Capital Times, which went the way of the dodo some, mm-hmm. some years ago. And that, that local paper no longer exists in a print form. So there's a whole, I mean, we could do a whole show on this and you probably shouldn't have me on for the show. So apologies to, <laughs> to the users that this isn't my total area of expertise, but I'm, I'm just trying to connect some dots here for people oh, to make valuable. sense of it, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, when we think about the differences between social media information circulation and something like journalism, agree or disagree with what you read in, in, in the newspaper or you hear on the news uh, of your choice. But there are things there that are not present in the same way in the social media ecosystem. 
a, you know, a, an author name, a set of principles mm -hmm. by which uh, the journalists at least pay lip service to, but most of them live by, you know, that they have been educated to, uh, to serve and then do so in their work. There's editorial control that before stories go to print, they have to go through a number of eyes. There's fact checking. If you've ever, you know, I've been on the, the, the side of having been interviewed for journalistic pieces and I get phone calls from fact checkers to make sure that the journalist got right what I Same said. Here. Yeah. <laughs> right. Do you think like, that did exists? Did you really like, say X, Y, Z? Yes, I did. That doesn't <laughs> exist in, you know, your, your, your racist uncle recirculating um, God knows what from whatever outlet. That is just go those, those, what we might think of barriers to entry, but we also might think of as safeguards are just gone. And with all of the other institutions eroded that I mentioned, you know, public schooling, library, public libraries, and so on, the mechanisms that people might use to vet material, to understand what it means when they look at a paper of record versus um, a dubious outlet, let's say, a, a dubious internet-based outlet, and how those uh, sources differ, those mechanisms to, to learn about those things have been eroded as well. Um, is there even a civics class anymore in public school? I see that uh, at least it looks like Donald Trump missed it when you know, when he was coming up based on what I saw in the debate the other night. I'm not sure uh, but, I had one growing up. I think that one might have already been spotty by the time I was in yeah, school. I, you know? I mean, I, yeah, I, I have that and I, I won't mention my age, but it's... It's oh, I think not, we're probably right around the same it's, it's, age. Not, it's not 29, but yeah, anyway. Right. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm trying to, I guess what I'm trying to do uh, in a roundabout way here is draw some connections mm -hmm. around phenomena that seem often um, like they have come from nowhere to yeah. say that actually it would behoove us to, to connect those dots right. both in this moment, but also draw back a little bit on history uh, at, at least the, the last 40 years of sort of like neoliberal uh, policies that have eroded the public sphere in favor of private industry. And it, what it didn't do was erode the public's desire to know, but what has popped up and cropped up in that vacuum left are these, uh, you know, really questionable uh, information sources that really don't respond to any greater norms other than partisanship, uh, advertising dollars, et cetera. And, and that's on a good day. I mean, those are the ones that aren't totally nefarious, like state and extra state, right. uh, you know, psyops generated stuff, right? It's, it's so interesting because when you were talking about YouTube, you mentioned about how the quote about how the AI is not watching the video. And, and mm -hmm. the, the comment you made was about, you know, the, the idea of sense making from the video. And what I'm hearing and what you're describing there is, you know, one of the kind of underlying themes of my work is that humans crave meaning and that a, a lot of one of the most sort of human qualities that we have or two of the most human qualities are meaning making and meaning uh, finding. So meaning seeking. Yeah. So yep. it strikes me that what you're describing is this kind of systemic change, you know, many systemic changes happening at once in what information is available, what information is provided, and yet our impulse to connect dots and create meaning is still there, but we're giving, we're given increasingly unreliable, potentially, uh, sources of information. And we're, we're still trying to connect those dots, but the, the dots that connect inevitably become simpler, more rudimentary, more, uh, fit, uh, more Bl conspiracy theory kind of narrative in many cases. Is that a fair characterization, do you think? I mean, I, that's absolutely the conclusion I come to. And I actually have a a, a doctoral candidate whom I supervise right now who's, who works on this notion of conspiracy theory. And we have talked, at, her name's Yvonne Eden, and I want to shout it out just because I want folks to look out for her coming up. Um, but I, I have talked with her and others about this topic significantly because I have quite, this may surprise people, but I have quite a sympathetic uh, 
orientation towards people who who fall prey to what we might consider, broadly speaking, conspiracy theories. Mm -hmm. And it's the reason you just laid out so eloquently that that human impulse, as you described it, right? And that's the that's really at the root of the show anyway, right? Yeah, that we're to yeah. all tech is human. And it's, it's about humanity. Mm -hmm. It's about digital humanity. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when I think about people who fall victim to to conspiracy theories, what I see underlying that is an is a human impulse to want to make sense of a world that increasingly doesn't. And they're doing it in the absence of information that is way more complex and hard to parse out and actually might um, point criticism at places that are very uncomfortable. Right. So, you know, a flat earther, a QAnon uh, adherent, et cetera, uh, whatever else is going, you know, lizard people who live under the crust of the earth. I mean, I've heard all of these things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like, it's like this process of finding black holes that uh, uh, astrophysicists engage in. It's not that they're seeing the black hole, it's that they're seeing the way the energy behaves around right. it. Right. Um, for, for example, that, you know, things might be congregating towards a point in space or, uh, you know, there's disruptions. Mm -hmm. And I think about that metaphor a lot when I think about people who fall victim to, to essentially bad information, that they sense, you know, a disruption in the force, right? They sense a disruption, they sense a, a wrongness about the world, but they don't have the right information um, presented to them or access to it, or even the ability to parse it because we've destroyed public schools. And now we, we might suggest in my own bout of conspiracy making that this kind of, again, debasement and destruction of these public institutions that help people uh, identify good information and be good citizens and understand the world around them in a, in a way that, you know, lasts longer than a blip on the screen uh, is political <laughs> and that it leaves them chasing their own tail through conspiracy theories instead of unpacking things like, you know, the consequences of, um, of Western imperialism mm -hmm. or understanding human migration as economic and environmental injustice issues or uh, the destruction of political systems that have long lasting consequences in their countries of origin that the U.S. may have been involved in, you know, like all of these kinds of things that you learn from studying history or social sciences or having a humanistic approach uh, to various topics that, you know, all of these spaces that are getting eroded from from kindergarten all the way through higher education um, have consequences. And then the, the auxiliary institutions that help people, such as libraries, and that that is happening not just in the in the public library sphere, but there's been gross consolidation in academic libraries over the years. Uh, the price of information access to journals has skyrocketed for virtually no reason, et cetera. You know, you combine all that and we have created essentially an information access problem and an information and an ability to parse information. Uh, problem for people. What do they do? They reach for the pablum of social media, which is instantaneous, always on, constantly circulating, speedy, easy to digest, uh, and worth about as much as, you know, those things might be worth. Yeah. Well, before we run out of time, I want to make sure we touch on the speaking of intersecting dimensional systems, uh, the work that you are doing with uh, with the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry, which, of course, you do with our previous delightful guest, Safia Noble. Uh, yes. We all love Safia Noble. Uh, the website describes it as um, an interdisciplinary research center committed to holding those who create unjust technologies and systems accountable for the erosion of equity, trust, and participation. I won't read the whole statement, but that immediately to me ties back into some of what you were just saying. So can you tell us a little bit about what your initiatives and programs are or are planned to be? Well, uh, absolutely. First of all, um, yeah, this is sort of, a, a, this is sort of the, uh, the the long lasting goal that Safia and I have had, and just so your your viewers and listeners have a little context, Safia and I uh, met essentially on our first day of our PhD program, and so that's we that's how far we go back, and we were both really involved in each of the origin stories of each other's research. And if you look at the work that I do on on humans and content moderation, and you look at the work that she does on algorithmic bias, you mm -hmm. can see 
you know, the, the D the DNA is swirling mm -hmm. around each other, born of so many conversations that she and I have had over the years. Uh, and so one of our long-term goals was to create a center uh, at what, well, first of all, our long-term goal was to get to the same academic institution, which for those of you in academia out there know, that is not an easy task. Uh, but we managed over the years to do that uh, through circuitous means, and we ended up at UCLA together. Then the second task that we had in mind was to create a center that would take the sum of the work that we do, put it together, and allow it to be bigger than it would be on its own because we would be able to invite others in under the umbrella and under the, you know, the big tent approach of having a center. And so it's really uh, taking uh, this opportunity of having some funding sources, bringing on other researchers, um, holding convenings, uh, hopefully sponsoring research studies, et cetera, uh, that will allow us to amplify the strands of the research that I talked about today and that uh, previous viewers and listeners will know about through Safia's work mm -hmm. and then amplifying that and, and making it bigger than we could on our own. So of course, in this particular moment, we're absolutely interested in, in focusing on things like uh, the political situation in the US and, and the election. Um, we're absolutely committed to and following the Black Lives Matter movement and how uh, that is that is playing out um, and and issues of of racial and social injustice and inequity that not only I would argue are perpetuated in social media but are exacerbated mm -hmm. in social media and um, you know thinking about ways in which interventions should take place so that that doesn't happen and, and I'll leave just one anecdote you know we were in a room once at a, at a megatech one of the many megatechs mm -hmm. with a, with an engineer who was working on a tool, his particular platform had, you know, had a, had a mechanism for people to post um, uh, job advertisements. And they were finding that, you know, people were doing a lot of uh, racist and, and other kinds of, you know, gender discriminatory things in their job ads, go figure. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, he was working more on the experimental side, thinking about how to make algorithms understand what might be fair. And, you know, he started ruminating, really, what is fairness, you know? And Safiya and I looked at each other. We're just about dying. We're sitting there together. And we say, say to the guy, you know, um, you could sit there and reinvent the many thousands of years of philosophical rumination on fairness, or you could look to guidance from the federal government that has laws about what constitutes fairness and hiring practices. <laughs> and in fact, we would argue that's what you should do. Uh, and that that's what you're compelled to do. So, so you see what that's I mean? So like this, mega tech. They're always doing that. I'm telling you, <laughs> mega tech, man, they're on my nerves. So, you know, this is the kind of this is the kind of um, the thing that that we want to do in a bigger way through the center, which mm -hmm. is to inform um, make these connections like we've talked about on the on the uh, on the program today um, talk to policymakers many of whom desperately want to be better informed themselves sure. right regulators uh politicians they're going to be the first to say it's a series of tubes may have been more correct than than not in retrospect right but they <laughs> they need help too to unpack and understand right and many of the firms themselves want to get better as well and we're we're here to do all of those things and more Oh, I, I want to give you a chance to um, point people to where they can find your work. I know that on, on the promo for this uh, show, we had Ubiquity75 as your Twitter handle. Are there other places people can find you online? Well, I think a great thing for folks to do would be to follow the C2I2, the UCLA C2I2 Twitter account. Uh, we also have a mailing list uh, that will become more active as we go forward. You can visit our website again, c2i2ucla.edu, and um, you know follow the initiatives there. I, I have to give people a you know a content warning that the the tweets from the last few days have a lot of naughty words in them because I was watching the the presidential debate and just losing my mind. Um, uh, but I'm not the only one. So, no, you're not uh, the only one. You know, <laughs> a caveat lector on my on my Twitter account. Just you know, I'm a human too, folks. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm a I'm a technological human too. That's fair enough. We uh, I think that's a great way to finish off this thought. Thank you so much. Thank you to our audience for tuning in. 
And uh, to David Ryan Fulger for our only question that was asked live today, but I know there must have been other ones. So uh, feel free, folks, to uh, follow up with Sarah on Twitter or on uh, her channels and um, engage with her work. Thank you, Sarah, for the work you're doing. It's, it's so appreciated and it's so important. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess I should say the book is called Behind the Screen, oh, yeah. Content Moderation in the Shadows of Social Media. I didn't mention that. That's the cover uh, right there. It's on Yale University Press. It's coming out in a French edition on October 8th on La Découverte uh, uh, Press. And so for any French speakers or French readers who may be watching, or if you have friends, uh, they can now read it in, in French. C'est fantastique. <laughs> oui, c'est magnifique, hein? Je All suis right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye now. All right. Thank you.